Good afternoon. My name is Betty Chang. I'm the research area lead at the European Food Information Council. And today I will be presenting on bridging the gap between healthy and sustainable diets. What types of information influence food choice? So the reason why we're interested in this topic is that consumer research shows that people are in favor of mandatory food labeling related to nutrition and environmental sustainability. Correspondingly, one of the European Commission's farm to fork strategy objectives is to create a harmonized food labeling framework that includes information about both the nutritional profile and the environmental sustainability of food products. The idea is that information about healthy and sustainable food will facilitate healthy and sustainable food choices, which in turn is expected to reduce the incidence of non-communicable disease and the environmental impact of the food system, respectively. However, there are different ways of informing consumers about healthy and sustainable diets, and not all of them are equally effective. So we conducted research expert studies to investigate how to effectively communicate to consumers in Europe about healthy and sustainable diets in order to facilitate their food choice. In order to do this, we first examined um, how consumers relate to healthy and sustainable diets and their information preferences regarding such diets in a semi-qualitative survey in study one. So in this case, semi-qualitative semi means that um, participants were not given open um, multiple choice questions to begin with, but they were given open-ended questions that they could answer just by typing their answer, um, typing their response off the top of their head. So there were spontaneous um, responses that were unconstrained. And then based on the results of this study, um, we this fed into study two. Um, where we ran an experiment providing consumers with various types of information about healthy and sustainable food and assess the effect of this information on the quantity of food they selected in a virtual shopping task. So both studies were conducted in eight European countries, UK, Slovenia, France, Germany, Poland, Spain, Sweden, and Turkey. And these countries were chosen in order to cover uh, geographical spread in Europe. We also chose some countries such as um, because they already have existing labeling systems, such as the tr multiple traffic light um, uh, nutrition label in the UK, the Keyhole logo in Sweden, and the Nutri-Score in France. And furthermore, these countries cover a diverse range of dietary patterns, which may also influence people's perception of nutrition and sustainable foods in these different countries. So looking at the first study, our research questions were mainly, what information do people consider when choosing healthy and sustainable food? What do they want to know about such foods? How would they like to receive this information? And how would this information be helpful to them? So uh, we also looked at to what extent do people aim to follow a healthy and or sustainable diet? because there is reason to suggest that depending on how engaged people are with these types of diets, um, they might have different types of information needs and preferences. So someone who is less engaged with eating healthily and or sustainability might have diff uh, different way preferred different ways of receiving information about healthy sustainable diets compared to someone who has been eating um, healthily and sustainably for a long time. So um, over these eight countries, we tested 100 people per country, so 800 participants in total. We had um, they, the people were chosen to be nationally representative in terms of gender and age, age up to age 64. We had about a 50-50 split of the education level <clears throat> because research has shown that people with a lower versus higher education level respond differently to healthy and sustainable eating. We also had almost a 50-50 split of whether they're from a rural or urban um, location in their country, because this has also been shown to influence people's behavior towards healthy and sustainable diets. And I, as I mentioned before, we measured the extent to which people are engaged, um, the extent to which they follow a healthy diet, and the extent to which they report following a sustainable diet. So you see, um, in general, there are more people who say that they follow 
a um, healthy diet compared to a sustainable diet. And people do vary uh, according to whether they are willing to follow such a diet, whether they don't know how to follow such a diet, so they don't know what it takes to follow a healthy or a sustainable diet. Some people know how, but they're not following one. And some um, many people um, are already um, consider that they're already following a healthy diet, and quite a few also consider that they follow a sustainable diet. Okay, so the results of this first study are that um, first we ask people to list which foods they currently eat that they consider to be healthy and sustainable. And then we ask them out of these foods that you listed, please explain why you think each is healthy and or environmentally sustainable. And the reasons that they gave us, we coded them into these categories. So as I mentioned before, they gave us anything off the top of their head in response to this question. And then we looked and said, does this, um, does this response represent nutritional value of the food? Does it represent the health benefit of the food, et cetera, for all these categories? And we found that uh, the three top categories, um, the reasons why people chose healthy and sustainable food was because of its nutrition value and its health benefits and the fact that they felt the food was natural. And then we asked people, what information do you consider or you have considered in the past when choosing each of these foods, categories of food that you consider to be healthy and sustainable that you currently consume? Um, and we see that in general, so these are percentages of participants. The top three responses were they consider the origin of the food, where it comes from, the nutrient content of the food, and the sensory properties, like how it tastes, how it smells, um, how it feels, the texture. There are some country variations. So here in Sweden, we see that um, compared to some other countries, health-related factors were more prioritized in Slovenia. They tended to prioritize more the environmental related factors compared to some other countries, but most of the countries prioritized health and environmental factors in a more balanced way. And uh, the origin and nutrient content were considered most by the particular group of people who want to eat healthily and sustainably, and at least they felt that they knew how to. So they felt informed about healthy and sustainable diets. And we then asked um, the participants, is there any information you would want to know in order to choose foods that are both healthy and environmentally sustainable? And they told us they wanted to know about the origin of the food, any information about how the food is produced, and uh, the food composition, such as ingredients. And they wanted to know about the environmental impact of the food. And consumers, when we ask them, how would you like to receive this information about, um, so this one was one multiple choice question. We had a few of them um, just to make it easier for people to respond in some cases. So they indicated that um, most the most popular channels they would like to receive the information from is on the food package, whether it's on the front or the back of the food package and off the shelf at the supermarket um, were the three most popular choices. So you can see that where people are making this decision, um, they would like the decision at the time of the, they're making it, like when they have the food in front of them or when they're at the supermarket. Okay, and we asked them, how would you Another multiple choice question in this case, <clears throat> how would you use this information? And they said um, most commonly, most people um, said to decide whether to consume a product or to decide between products of the same category. <clears throat> Some people admitted that they wanted this information to feel better about their choice and to decide how much they should consume of a product. Okay. Uh, and some people said that this information was useful for them to decide whether they would um, choose to consume a product for the first time. Okay, 
So the conclusions of the first study are that um, the information people consider when choosing a healthy and sustainable foods are the origin, nutrient content, and sensory properties. So um, we considered for our next study to present information about the nutrient content. What they wanted to know mainly, the top three, were the origin um, of the food, the production information, food composition, and environmental impact. Uh, and so we considered to uh, show the environmental impact of the food in study two because often um, the food composition, well, it's already on the food, so people already have access to the information, and that's often the case also with origin information. Um, when the, the, uh, the other conclusion is that people want to receive this information mainly on the food packaging, front or back, or off the shelf at the supermarket. So we presented these types of um, information at the information that you would tend to display in these channels in our follow-up study. And because people said they often would use this information to decide whether to consume a product or to decide between similar products, we presented these types of decision scenarios in our next study. So the next study, um, just a quick recap in our study one, consumers said they wanted to know about nutrition some nutritional and environmental impact information on food packaging in order to choose products that are both healthy and sustainable. You will notice that the, the top reference was origin, but since origin is not always a reliable indicator of whether a food is sustainable, we did not choose to uh, present this information in study two. In our study two, the aim was to examine different ty these types of information on people's food choices in an online shopping experiment. Um, so we we chose to present this um, information as if it was um, on a label. But we also contrasted this with another type of um, form of information, which is that of a dietary recommendation <clears throat> about healthy and sustainable diets, because uh, previous research from um, Dabao, who will be presenting um, soon in our symposium, has shown that a, recommend, a general recommendation about healthy and sustainable, uh, I mean, recommendations about healthy and sustainable diets can also be effective in improving um, the nutritional quality of people's food and reducing the environmental impact of their choice. But I'll let him talk more about that. So our research questions were in study two is, um, whether nutrition and environmental impact labels help people to choose more healthy and sustainable food, whether a general dietary recommendation about healthy and sustainable eating can also help them to choose healthy and more sustainable food, what are people's preferences re um, related to these types of information, and how much more would they be willing to pay um, for, uh, how much would they be willing to pay for food with such um, with these labels. And to what extent, to, again, as with study one, we looked at to what extent people aim to follow a healthy and sustainable diet. So um, this is the design of our study. Our objective was to test um, whether this labeling about um, nutrition, the nutrition content of the food and the environmental impact of the food um, would influence people's food choices in a virtual shopping task and con contrast this to another group that just received a recommendation, um, which was, do you want to live more healthily and reduce the environmental impact of your diet? You can do so by replacing some of the red meat, example, beef, pork, you eat with other sources of proteins like legumes, example, pulses, beans, lentils, nuts, and sustainable fish or seafood and by increasing your consumption of vegetable, fruit, and whole grains. So some people saw either the, this label information, they saw either this recommendation, um, or another group of people saw both the labels and the recommendation, because sometimes in the real world, people have both types of information, and we want to see how it, it is for them when they have both types, is it too much information? And then um, we compared, their behavior to a group that received none of this information. And um, in this shopping task, people were told that they need to purchase food for three days because they're out on a holiday and they can't um, have access to other sources 
of food. And they had to purchase from these 30 food categories, they had to select which foods they would pick. Um, so they had four choices per category and the quantity of food. So for example, here is um, uh, uh, dairy alt uh, yogurt, non-dairy yogurts. So, so um, plant-based yogurt alternatives. And there are four choices here and they choose if they want one cup, two or three, five. And so we have um, these similar examples for all the other food categories here. So this represents quite a big range of different food categories, which you don't normally see in the, these types of studies. OK, in this case, we um, tested fi around 550 participants per country. So we had over 4000 participants across the eight countries. Again, they were representative on age, uh, nationally representative of age, gender with a 50 split on high low education and rural urban location. And similar to study one, we also looked at, um, we see similar proportions of the extent to which people follow a healthy diet and a sustainable diet. So the effects, um, so it, as an overall thing, the recommendation um, in people who saw the recommendation did improve the overall nutrition quality of their shopping basket. Um, and the, but in the labeling condition, this, um, they only improved their nutrition quality in uh, consumers who, own, who at least know how to eat sustainably and who um, also follow a sustainable diet. So here, um, for those who know how to eat sustainably, that's about 23% um, of the sample, and those who already eat sustainably, um, about 35% of the sample. So quite a few people um, also were improved their, their nutrition quality of their choices through the labeling, but um, the recommendation improved the nutrition quality for uh, a larger group of people. Okay, <clears throat> but when it came to the overall sustainability of people's shopping baskets, um, neither labeling or the recommendation had an effect. Uh, but we see that labeling did reduce, when we look at specific food groups, labeling reduced the amounts of meat and vegetables people chose and increased the amounts of fruit. Um, but it's, it was, we had some quite selective effects. So in terms of meat, um, labeling reduced meat uh, choices only in those who already eat healthily and those who don't eat healthily anymore, which is a very small group of people. Um, in the UK, it was only in those who don't know how to eat healthily that labeling helped them to reduce meat. In France and Poland, only those who know how to eat healthily um, used the label to help them reduce uh, their meat choices. So you can see that there are some country differences. Um, it, but um, for the recommendation, meat intake was reduced only in those who don't know how to eat healthily. Um, Yes, uh, it may be surprising to see that vegetable consumption was also reduced um, through labeling. And, um, but for the recommendation, this only occurred for a very small sample of the people. And fruit intake was increased um, by labeling only by in those who know how to eat sustainably and who are already eating sustainably. So just over half of the sample. And um, the recommendation increased food intake only in those who don't know how to eat healthily. Um, in terms of legumes, the recommendation did increase um, legume intake, but not um, labeling. And the recommendation uh, reduced whole grain intake, even though whole grains are mentioned in the recommendation, um, but not labeling did not have an effect here. And for the plant-based dairy alternatives, um, only the, those in urban areas tended um, to use the, the labeling influence that increased their choice of plant-based dairy alternatives, but the recommendation had no effect um, for this food category. And neither of and the labeling or the recommendation affected people's choices of fish, dairy, or plant-based meat alternatives. Okay, so looking at um, the, you may remember that the food products had different grades with the A grade being um, the, the better nutrition um, uh, indicator of better nutrition quality and the E grade being 
um, indicator of the uh, least um, nutritious type of food. And we see that um, for the A grade nutrition products, only though it reduced um, people's choice of such products in a very small sample of those who don't eat sustainably anymore. Um, but in, in general, it didn't um, tend to, the, the nutrition grade didn't, in, uh, the higher grades didn't influence people's choices in general that much, but the lower grades did influence people's choices with the C grade kind of more of the, being in the average, reducing choice in females and people reducing their choice of D and E products with the, um, yeah, for the nutrition label. For the environmental label grade, uh, we see that a higher grade, um, A, B, um, A increased people's choice of A products only in those who know how to eat sustainably and those who already do so. So the, the people who are more engaged with sustainable eating made use of the um, labeling to increase the choice of um, environmental, higher environmental graded products. And it reduced it for a small group of the sample who don't eat sustainably anymore. Also the same with B grade products, or reduced it in a very small sample of people who are not engaged, no longer engaged with sustainable eating. And across, um, people did also tend across the groups to choose fewer um, environmental C grade products, fewer environmental D grade products, and for E grade products, they chose fewer if they lived in rural areas, and um, for those who already eat healthily and those who don't eat healthily anymore. So actually, this is fifty-two percent. Sorry about the the typo here. Um, so it's oh no 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 that is that is correct. It is five point two percent. So it's those who used to eat healthily but don't eat healthily anymore, which is a very small sample of the the group. Yeah. So in general, the um, labeling helped those who are more knowledgeable about healthy and or sustainable eating, and the recommendation helped those who are less knowledgeable about healthy and or sustainable eating. So for the labeling, they reduced meat consumption in those who already eat healthily or who don't eat healthily anymore, increased fruit in those who know how to eat sustainably or who don't, who, who, um, who already eat sustainably, increased the choice of environmental grade A products in those who know how to eat sustainably or already eat sustainably, and decreased the choice of environmental grade E products who already eat healthily and those who don't eat healthily anymore. And the recommendation had reduced meat consumption and increased fruit consumption in those who don't know how to eat healthily, um, a relatively small percentage of the sample. Okay. People's perceptions and preferences regarding the labels and recommendation. So in general, um, when we asked people to rate how useful they found the different types of information were, they considered the nutrition index as most useful, the environment, followed by the environmental index, and then followed by the recommendation about healthy and sustainable eating. Um, on average, when we asked people, how much would you pay to have this information? Um, they said that they would pay about 46.4 cents for the nutrition index label and 42.8 for the environmental index label. So this is regardless of the actual grade of the product, but just for the information about its nutrition quality or about its um, environmental impact. And in terms of their preferences of where they wanted to access this information, in general, they prefer to access the nutrition um, index label information on the food packaging um, compared to whether it was on the product page during online shopping, maybe because fewer people engage in online shopping. And the third choice we gave was um, via scanning a barcode or QR code, like a smart label on the product which would allow them to receive more detailed information on the individual dimensions of the label, such as salt, sugar, protein. So people um, yeah, were less interested in receiving information through um, that channel as well, compared to on the food packaging. Um, 
And when we asked people about the same questions about how they would like to access information about the environmental impact of the product, uh, the most popular channel was on the food packaging. Um, and yeah, less compared to on the product page during online shopping or scanning a code which would allow them on the product, which would allow them to receive more detailed information about the different environmental dimensions of the product. Okay. So in some cases, participants preferred to, um, when it came to their recommendation about healthy or um, uh, and sustainable eating, they prefer to access their recommendation off the shelf. Um, compared to on the product page during, um, online for some people in, in some of the countries. But the, the differences um, between the two channels were not as much as we see for the labels. And they generally, so when we asked them where they, they wanted to have a standardized label that was um, determined by an external um, national EU body, or whether they preferred to have a personalized label that um, aggregated the, that allowed them to see the information about the, the individual components of the nutrition quality, like salt, sugar, fat, protein, or, um, or the, in, they said that in general, they prefer to have the standardized one. Um, and we even gave them the option of having both, having access to both the standardized and the personalized label, but still they tended to prefer to have the um, access to the standardized only. And when we ask them the same question for the environmental labels, do you want to have, um, prefer to access one that is a standardized environmental label determined by external or um, national or EU body, or a personalized one, or both? Um, they tended to prefer to have the standardized one um, only compared to the other choices. Okay, so the conclusions from um, our second study is that uh, comparing the outcomes of labels versus the recommendation on people's food choice. So the, for labels, um, the overall nutrition quality of people's shopping baskets improved in those who at least know how to eat sustainably. So um, that was a bit more than 50% of the, the population, that group who had were more engaged with sustainable eating. And for the recommendation, um, this improvement in nutrition quality occurred across all, all the types of participants, regardless of the extent to which they were engaged with healthy and or sustainable eating. In terms of the sustainability, um, overall sustainability of the shopping baskets, it was not affected either by the labels or the recommendations, but we do see some changes in particular um, food groups. So for the labels, they tended to influence those who are more knowledgeable about healthy and or sustainable eating to choose more fruit, less meat, less vegetables, more sustainable products. So the ones with the higher um, environmental impact scores and fewer products with um, the, the worst environmental impact scores and also to choose fewer, less nutritious products. So the ones with the lower environmental um, nutrition index scores. For the recommendation, it influenced those who are less knowledgeable about healthy eating to choose more fruit and less meat. And um, we, in terms of people's preferences for the labels, they preferred an unpacked standardized label it determined by an external body, um, a national or EU body. And for the recommendation, with, when we asked people if they wanted it on the shelf or um, Online, they prefer to have it in some countries in Germany, Spain and Slovenia, they wanted it on the shelf. And um, in terms of willingness to pay, people were willing to pay 46.4 cents on average, more for the information about the nutrition uh, quality of the food. And um, on average, they were willing to pay about 42.8 cents to know about the environmental impact of the food. So. Thank you very much. These are all the people who helped with our research. Um, so 
uh, from uh, from UFIG, from Aarhus University, from Wageningen University, and from um, Nutris, the Slovenian Nutrition Institute. And thank you also to all the organizations who funded this research. Um, do you have any questions? Or should thank we... you very much, Betty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so very interesting. I see there's already 190 people online. We've got um, a lot of questions, but I'm also uh, mindful of time because it's already 37 and there's still three more speakers to go. So what I would suggest is that we give the word to Armando. That doesn't mean that we won't respond to these uh, questions. What we will do instead is we will create a Q&A document where we will reply to all these questions and we'll, we will send it together with the recording, the slides, etc. Yeah, just to allow time for the other speakers. Sounds good sure. to you? Yes. Perfect. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Armando Perescueto and I am a professor at the Department of Food, Nutrition and Culinary Science at Umeå University in Sweden. And I have been invited today to provide some reflections on innovative ways to overcome barriers to dietary shift. The, obviously, the first thing I need to indicate is that um, I need to move here. Uh, is my conflicts of interest. I, I declare that I don't have any financial conflicts of interest. However, I have personal conflicts of, uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, I have um, a daughter that, uh, that is five years old and uh, her future uh, depends very much on our um, societal dietary choices. Dietary change will have a long lasting effect for current and future generations. And furthermore, I want my daughter to live in a world where the food system is more compassionate and does not require the killing of more than 2,000 animals every second of the day. That is my uh, disclaimer. So, um, for the agenda, we are going to see three things. Um, when we speak about sustainability, I think it's always good to remind ourselves of the urgency of dietary change. Uh, then I will share with you some findings of a pan-European survey that was condu conducted uh, last year and some of the barriers uh, towards dietary change in Europe. And uh, lastly, I will share with you some results of a, of a nice intervention using virtual reality uh, in order to facilitate um, a sustained change. So. Um, do you think that changing our diets is urgent? I guess uh, if I would see your hands and if you would be in a, uh, in a classroom, uh, many of you would say yes, uh, maybe others would say no. Uh, but uh, it is undeniable that uh, even today we are um, living uh, anomalies in temperatures worldwide and as I am in, now in close to the Arctic, we can see that uh, the temperatures are really uh, beyond what it is expected in this um, period. And this has been going as a trend in the last 100 years. So, um, at the beginning of the year, the International Intergovernmental Panel of, of, on Climate Change uh, had a a document that was the coming from the World Group, Group 3, and they indicated that mitigation and development goals cannot be met through incremental change. So basically they were calling to very radical actions in all the fronts that are related to sustainability. The year before, the, the IPCC also wrote that um, we need to come out of denial in the sense that it is human influence that is warming the atmosphere, the ocean and the land. So if we, uh, we have put this pressure on the planet, probably it is up to us to get out of that. So um, a few weeks ago, this uh, paper in science um, showed that uh, actually the situation is worse than we would expect. The location of climate tipping, typing, uh, tipping elements in the cryosphere 
um, biosphere and the ocean and global warming levels at which the tipping points will be likely triggered. And then they they show that the, the pins according to the colors, and you can see that uh, something that uh, um, that is within the Paris Agreement is a light orange uh, circles between two and four degrees um, that might be attainable with the current policies. They are um, the orange diamonds, and what is above four degrees is uh, red triangles and you can see that uh, the temperatures and the uh, what is happening in the nordic uh, and southern hemispheres are in at the worrisome level last week um the the lancet countdown report for 2022 um issued uh, this paper and they indicate, of course, health is at the mercy of fossil fuels, but within the, the whole paper and the indicators, they write that red meat and milk contribute to 55% of global agricultural emissions. Furthermore, um, meat and dairy are not only contributing to the emissions, but they are contributing to um, to deaths. Uh, in 2019, 11.5 million deaths were attributable to imbalanced diets, with 17% associated with a high intake of red and processed meat and dairy products. And that's uh, that's the, the those were quotes that I copied specifically from the paper. So it's important to to remember that that is uh, where the consensus is uh, is coming. Um, also, it's important to remember that. Um, uh, this slide shows that the most efficient animal-based protein production has a larger carbon footprint than the most inefficient plant-based protein production. This morning, I, however, found that uh, uh, there was a poll in the uh, in the United Kingdom, and it it seems that still that about forty percent of respondents think that eating local animal products is one of the best two ways to reduce carbon emissions from animal agriculture. It was done by uh, James uh, Osden. And this is uh, this is surprising because it goes uh, against what scientists and people um, who are working with environmental sustainability uh, would say. Um, it is important to remember that agriculture and deforestation uh, that sector is responsible for 24 up to 37 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there are there, the the levels uh, are varying, but uh, the, the the latest evidence uh, puts the the role at the higher uh, side rather than the lower. And animal source foods are responsible of 83% of the food sector greenhouse gas emissions. And the papers uh, where I uh, am citing are uh, there. Uh, today, only 55% of the world's crop calories feed people directly, and the rest are fed to livestock. So the, the reason to keep the system is uh, slightly confusing. If it would be money, for example, if you would give for every 100 euros, uh, you will get only 40 euros in return. Or um, as it is, the, if you would give uh, 100 kilocalories of grain, you would get 40 on milk, 22 on eggs, 12 on chicken, 10 of pork or 3 of beef. Um, any economist would say that is not necessarily the best business. Um, when it is measured in money, it's not a, a good business, but we still think that this is good business uh, in the food sector. So a few years ago, there was um, a paper uh, by Joseph uh, Poor, uh, in, and he indicated that uh, eating a 100% plant-based diet, or, or a diet that, uh, that excluded foods of animal origin, basically, was the single biggest way to reduce the environmental impact on Earth of people, and, and and that was what could be done at consumer level. And if we go back to the slide here, 
we can see that this is this is not the case and there is still a lot of work to be done with consumers so um, under these circumstances mainstreaming a diet based mainly on plants or uh, excluding animal source foods is unavoidable and although popular discourses suggest that the barriers are still very high i will show you that uh, this is not uh, the case so in the frame of uh, smart protein uh, project we conducted um, a large pan-european survey and it was uh, conducted by innova uh, it ran in nine european countries is one of the largest uh, plus the uk uh, which is now not europe anymore and it is 10 countries uh, seven 1,500 answers and plus, and it was representative for the people in the country uh, with quotas for 50 females, 50 males, and uh, age groups that were balanced, uh, allowing comparisons between countries per age group. Uh, we have recently published a, a paper at, uh, about this, and people can uh, download it and, because it is open access. Uh, about the barriers towards plant-based food consumption at the International Journal of Gastronomy and Food Science. But with 30% of flexitarians, the mainstream um, omnivores are the ones that are experiencing the barriers um, or mainstream consumers, although they are, they are omnivores together with flexitarians, they seem to be experiencing the barriers at a lesser level. Um, and it's important to mention that uh, from the data, uh, only 10 to 15 percent of uh, people in, in Europe uh, would be anyhow adhering to um, nutrition recommendations and guidelines regarding uh, what they should be eating. So, as I said, the barriers are experienced in different ways uh, by consumers. And this is a this is a complex uh, slide with lots of uh, lots of text, so I will just navigate through it very quickly. But um, you see the uh, at this side those those who are red are those who are who score very high in the in the scale, and the most important barriers um, that are that score the highest in Europe are have to do with the price perception and availability. However, the year effect sizes are small. It is important to un underline that those, uh, those barriers are in the food sector camp. It is the food sector that can make these foods um, more available and uh, at, a, at a reasonable price. And the actual effect sizes are higher for the hedonic expectations or experiences like in taste but also to lay beliefs regarding the nutritional sufficiency of plant-based diets, in particular, that humans must eat animals. So, um, I think a key element here is that the experience of barriers is at a lesser extent as the popular discourses would indicate. And obviously this is, uh, this is not surprising, but the, the group of people who mostly experience barriers are those um, omnivore uh, group. They are now 60% of the population. And it is uh, encouraging to see that uh, at least 30% of people uh, are uh, flexitarians, therefore people that are reducing their intake of foods of animal origin, mostly for ethical reasons. Uh, in agreement to some of the findings that were presented uh, earlier, um, we cannot underestimate the sensory determinants of food choice and food preferences. Taste ranks always as first, and that was the case with the survey. Therefore, the challenge for a dietary shift is intimately linked to the sensory characteristics of foods based on alternative proteins. We know, of course, the change in diet habits is difficult. I, I, I don't know anyone that would say the contrary. Uh, our previous experiences show that nudge interventions had modest results, if any. And 
the, and some some of those results are better than simply giving information or educating. So we need to think of how can we overcome known barriers to diet behavior, to diet shift. Are there any innovative venues worth exploring? And of course, um, in his talk, How to Transform Apocalypse Fatigue into Action on Global Warming, uh, psychologist and economist Per Espen Stokes indicated that we should step away from the doomsday narratives and learn how to make caring for the earth feel personable, doable, and empowering with this fun, informative talk. So, uh, or changing the narratives in making it more uh, more closer. But one of the first steps that that he says in his in his talk is to remove the distance, uh, to lower the defenses that uh, we use to avoid um, uh, the dim thinking that uh, our planet uh, is going to be destroyed. And after COVID, the virtual reality and IT solutions became more and more part of daily life. And together with the co-authors of, uh, of a paper that I will introduce now, we hypothesized hypothesized that virtual reality could aid interventions and could fill some of the missing gaps. So why? Of course, uh, there is a low impact of standard interventions. So the effect sizes of the standard, uh, the Cohen deltas are relatively low. Um, immersive uh, uh, virtual reality can promote pro environmental behaviors. And of course, response efficacy, self-efficacy, emotions, and social norms are the main uh, predictors for pro-environmental behavior. So, um, together with the uh, virtual learning lab, this uh, um, there was a simulation that was uh, prepared, and I will share that with you. If um, no. Lunch, dinner, and snack. Please select three items from each category. After you are done shopping, press the cart symbol. Great, you have selected all items from the breakfast category. Great, you have selected all items from the lunch category. It is really nice to have you here. You can look around and see how beautiful this place is. There, look, there are two moose. Wow, not every. Oh no, I can see outbreaks of pine beetles which are destroying the trees. It makes them vulnerable and drier. It's not as good. Here is the environmental pyramid. On the top of the pyramid, you can see foods that are bad for the natural environment. Look, beef is at the top of the pyramid, the highest. Great, you have selected all items from the breakfast category. Look, this is amazing. Nature is preserved. Thank you for traveling with me. I hope you. So um, in this simulation, we invited people to make choices, um, current choices, and they were invited to travel in time, basically. And uh, the idea was to invite people to see the consequences that their actions summed up with the actions of many others would have in the future. It was a randomized control trial uh, with 123 psychology students. They were uh, relatively young in Denmark. And the main outcome was um, dietary footprint. And of course, there were two conditions, the virtual related intervention versus a passive control condition. So the, the promising results were 
um, that response efficacy and knowledge were changed significantly, but not the distance. That was the main reason we wanted to do this uh, this, is the, this experiment, uh, because this is one of the first barriers that people will, will express towards dietary shift. What we could also see is that this combination of information and immersive uh, intervention uh, yielded that one week later, participants would report still a, lo a lower dietary footprint than before the intervention. So there, 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 is, there was a, a positive effect. The paper was uh, published in uh, scientific reports, and this is a list of the papers that, uh, uh, that are based on the work we have been doing in collaboration with the virtual learning lab. So the time was 20 minutes and I am finishing now. Um, in conclusion, a dietary shift uh, is urgent and it cannot be postponed longer. Um, typical barriers are weak in the population and mostly experienced by omnivores. And virtual reality interventions can be one way to facilitate sustained dietary shift. I need to make the uh, right acknowledgements. Um, the study on the barriers to dietary shift was funded by Europe through Smart Protein Project Grant Agreement 862957. And I want to thank uh, the colleagues, uh, Dr. Adela Plesha, Ple Plesciata, uh, Professors uh, Guido Makransky and Thomas Morton for the virtual reality study. The virtual reality study was a collaboration without external funding. Uh, between the Virtual Learning Lab in Copenhagen and uh, myself at the Department of Food Science uh, uh, at the University of Copenhagen. That was my previous affiliation. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention and I use 21 minutes. Sorry for that. Thank you very much, Armando. And uh, I have to apologize even more to that I went over time. So don't worry about your 21 minutes at all. We just have one. Um, a question about the methodology of your your research. Somebody asked whether the survey results take into account self-selection bias in terms of the people who are willing to participate in the survey, maybe a group of people who do who are different from um, the rest of the population um, in terms of maybe their food interests, for example. Uh, you are uh, the, the, the food smart uh... Survey uh, the barriers study. That's the one they are asking, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'm guessing it's that one. They didn't specify. Yeah, um, but that the we precisely subcontracted the data collection to Innova. So it was a uh, it was through um, a March mar market research agency, so that we we get uh, people that are representative of the countries. So th th there's no there's no source of bias in that one. OK, thank you very much, Armando. Um, and I'm since I'm conscious of time, uh, the remaining questions we if we have time after the talks, we can answer. Otherwise, we will um, answer them uh, when we send the recording. OK, and I also have to apologize that um, Armando was too quick before and he introduced himself, even though I had written an introduction for him, but he did a great job of introducing himself. So now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Michel Debao, who recently finished his PhD in bioscience engineering at um, KU Leuven, the University of Leuven. He's working at the sustainable food department of the Belgian supermarket chain Kochet Group. He has conducted several studies on nutrition and environmental impact labeling as part of European projects. Michel will be talking today about the role of labels in achieving sustainable food consumption. Thank you very much, Michel. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Betty, for the introduction. And of course, thank you for inviting me as a speaker to this webinar. Uh, in the coming 20 minutes, I'm going to address two main things. So first of all, I'm going to share some key insights of my PhD, which indeed I recently defended a few months ago at KU Leuven. And after that, I'm going to give you some insights into how Colored Group, my current employer, is uh, looking at this facilitation of healthy, sustainable food choices amongst consumers. Um, 
since I only have 20 minutes, I will just start right away with this first slide. So I start by the general statement that, as I guess we all agree, there is a need uh, to improve the way we produce, process, distribute and consume our food. Although action is needed throughout the entire value chain, I've been focusing mostly on the consumption phase. Um, the overall objective of my PhD was to investigate how a collective shift in food choices, generally speaking towards a more nutritious plant-based food and less processed animal-based food, could be induced. And this was, of course, with the ultimate goal of reducing pressure being put on public health as well as on the environment. Many different interventions to change behavior exist, which can be ranked according to their degree of autonomy restriction. So ranging from very soft interventions, like mostly informing people on the issue to the more, uh, let's say, hard interventions, which include restrictions and bans on undesirable behavior. On the softer side of the spectrum, front of pack labels are a very common approach nowadays. Front of pack labels are essential in signaling unobservable characteristics like the environmental impact or nutritional values of food. But the European labeling landscape has been suffering from several shortcomings. Not only do consumers hardly use these labels, there are also way too much different labels, which consumers often do not understand and trust, and which are often not based on the most scientifically robust indicators. As a result, 50% of the European consumers would still find it difficult to identify sustainable food. The need, for, um, the need for a science-based trusted front of pack label has been expressed in the European single market for green products and more recently also in the Green Deal, including in the farm to fork strategy and in the circular economy plan. As a reaction to this need, a new stream of labels has been emerging with the intention to create more simplicity to become more intuitive, standardized and transparent. And this happened first for nutrition labels on the left side of these slides, where the Nutri score is very prominent nowadays in Europe, and more recently also environmental impact labels emerged on the market. One of the main objectives of my PhD was to evaluate to what extent this new stream of labels, and particularly then the environmental uh, impact labels, could contribute to the intended shift towards more healthy, sustainable food choices. A first point I'd like to highlight that there is indeed a strong market opportunity for these intuitive color graded environmental labels. As consumers are increasingly concerned on the environmental impact of their food, yet at the same time experience difficulties in identifying those sustainable products. So this is where those labels can uh, cover a gap. Consumer support increased transparency on food products and particularly um, the concept of an environmental impact label is highly supported, which we have observed in several qualitative interviews. So consumers like the idea of having an, uh, um, a trusted environmental impact score. What we find in another study, which has recently been published in Food Policy, I have the reference below on this slide, is that consumers would also have an increased willingness to pay for products with better eco scores. In this particular study, we focused on vegetable consumption and observed increases in willingness to pay between 13 and 25% per incremental improvement of eco score. So that means going from B to A uh, would uh, result in an increased willingness to pay amongst consumers. In the same study, we also benchmarked this preference to more established sustainability attributes and find that Having a better eco score is considered almost equally important as localness and is five times more important than uh, having an organic label. Secondly, knowing that consumers often overestimate their consideration of sustainability in food choices leaves the question to what extent these preferences are actually being reflected in food choices. In a study we did almost one year ago with the, together with the Spanish research institute ASTI, we observe that displaying environmental scores on food products and price tags makes consumers 16% more likely to choose the more environmentally friendly alternatives. And this is in line with the uh, existing literature, well, uh, which I've listed some there on the first bullet point. Um, and what makes this potential even more interesting is that while being affected in their choices, 
we did not observe any additional time being spent uh, in their choices. So this confirms the very fast and intuitive character, uh, which is, of course, essential in food choices as consumers make these choices very fast, only take a couple of seconds. And then my last bullet point here is that this effect of environmental scores of food choices is very similar to the existing literature, which is more extensive, uh, on the effect of nutri scores on um, food choices. I listed a few references here in the third bullet point. So it needs to be stressed, however, that all these studies referred to on this slide only evaluate the presence of one single score, so either an environmental score or a, a nutritional score. A third point relates to the way information captured in this label is being processed by consumers. So on the one hand, due to, due to the automatic associations linked to green and red colors, consumers can be affected in their choices without actively thinking about the environment. On the other hand, in case of an indirect attention effect, uh, consumers should actively look at the score and therefore attach more importance to the environment than they would have done in absence of the score. And in our study, we try to uh, explain the observed effect through such an indirect attention route, although we could not find any evidence for this uh, mechanism. And therefore, so far, let's say that the direct automatic effect is the predominant mechanism driving the observed effects. So there is a market opportunity for these labels, which are mostly being processed automatically. And this, well, and this makes uh, this makes real market implementations of these labels extremely challenging. Environmental scores are being implemented on top of existing sustainability labels and not instead of. In addition, nutri scores and eco scores are being displayed together. Since food choices are made very fast, it is obvious that the consumer will have to set priorities at some point. In line with this, we find in the e-grocery uh, experiment, which I just found out that was nicely uh, replicated by Betty with the same findings locally, um, that displaying both Nutri and Eco scores only improves food choices in terms of nutritional quality and not in terms of environmental impact. This study is published. The, uh, the, uh, citation is below here on the slide. And what makes it more interesting is we do not only find that once, we did also replication study one year later with 1,000 consumers, which resulted in exactly the same findings. So this suggests that consumers might only be able to take one of these labels at a time, and that, that nutritional label, uh, nutritional information is then being prioritized over environmental information. Another consequence is that consumers might situationally choose which information source to rely on depending on their value. In this concrete example, we find, for instance, that localness is considered much more important for products with a bad eco-score, left side of this graph, the E, than products with a good eco-score. There, all of a sudden, the increase in utility is much smaller than for the products with bad eco-scores. Um, Therefore, I think the main conclusion so far is that we will have to think beyond labels if we really want to change uh, consumers to change uh, their behavior. Within the, let's say, informational approaches, which we've been discussing so far mostly, uh, it is essential to, first of all, minimize the efforts or the attention needed um, from the consumer. It could be argued um, that considering considering both eco-scores and nutri-scores on top of price and taste, the more important attributes, let's say, becomes a very complex task. However, generally speaking, as also already introduced by Betty, um, general guidelines on healthy, sustainable food consumption can be easily narrowed down to some basic rules of terms. And as an example, we tested the effect on food choices of displaying these rules of terms or recommendations, and this resulted so here is the study that uh, Betty was referring to earlier, and we find indeed that this specific guideline, so maybe just a few more seconds, it's giving some advice on advised uh, consumption quantities for meat specifically and vegetables. And we find this simple cue 
leads to improvements both in nutritional quality as well as in environmental impact, as opposed to the absence of effect in both dimensions as in response to these scores, as I described earlier. So first thing, beyond labels, if you come up with information, you should think about how to minimize the effort uh, needed to process information. Second point is to maximize the personal relevance linked to the information transferred by the scores. So more examples of our studies are displayed here on the right. For example, the inclusion of a average basket score rather than requiring uh, consumers to look for every individual, um, every individual product to the scores. This is a, a way of giving feedback and hence more personalizing uh, information to the consumer. And secondly, uh, you can also think about introducing social norms, communicating uh, a norm about what desirable behavior is so that consumers can benchmark their own behavior to those of their peers. Finally, it is also important to realize that informative approaches, which I've been discussing now mostly, are known to be least effective in changing food choices. Therefore, beside the so-called cognitively oriented nudges, a stronger focus on the food environment is needed. Focusing on convenience and availability, it is in addition essential to intervene in the habitual process of food consumptions, as those are amongst the main drivers of food choices. A final example here on the right side of the slide demonstrates the usefulness of food swaps here in one of our experiments, uh, where we offered alternatives based on selected products with either uh, an improved nutritional value or an improved eco score. Uh, and we observed that all of a sudden consumers reacted to the eco score. So this really highlights the importance and the complementarity of labels and interventions that facilitate the, the, the switches uh, made by consumers. So by minimizing the required effort to switch, consumers might all of a sudden uh, start considering also the eco score. So both scores started working. Um, I think that's it for, well, some of the highlights of my PhD. And I will now switch uh, heads to the Colred group. Uh, because I will give you some insights in how we are looking at Colrad to this facilitation of healthy, sustainable food choices. And I will start with a video. For the coming year, Colrad Group has a clear ambition, taking its sustainability efforts to the next level and helping people to consume more sustainably, step by step, starting with the environment. To have a real impact, Colrod Group decided to embrace and promote the EcoScore, a label rating the environmental impact of products from A to E. Easy. But changing consumer behavior is quite a challenge. The EcoScore is a completely new concept. So to create awareness and convince people to use this EcoScore, we decided to make things ecological. Together with eco-influencers Bartel van Rietz and Vince Kante, we took a first step in our campaign by explaining the reasoning behind the EcoScore, how it works and how it is calculated for specific products. L'EcoScore A se situe entre 80 et 100 sur 100. Waar vind je de EcoScore? Op een verpakking? Of kijk in onze apps. In a second campaign wave, we stepped into the kitchen. B, 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 A. Comme c'est beau ça. Making eco-friendly cooking not only ecological, but also fun and delicious. We launched a series of eco challenges emphasizing the fun part of eco. Over 50 videos were distributed in a performant eco system. In addition, we derived a whole range of assets to enrich our story. And it was not only the EcoScore that generated impact, so did our campaign. With an impressive reach, astonishing attention for our videos, and clear action by the viewers. And just like our sustainable efforts can never stop, nor will our campaign. Logis ecologique. So I couldn't have done it better as the guy in the video explained, but Colorado Group has indeed been taking up a leading role on the implementation of EcoScore since it launched in March 2021. The EcoScore is a French scoring system which uses secondary LCA data from the Agribalise database. And this database includes 2,500 food products 
And in order to make the EcoScore somewhat more product specific, a bonus malus layer, including primary data on production methods, packaging, transport, and biodiversity is being added. At Colorado Group, we are aware that this is method is certainly not perfect yet. However, thanks to the use of secondary data, this is the only affordable and scalable system at the moment. This allowed us to already start communicating to the consumer and to become the very first retailer in Europe having an EcoScore now since a few days for all their products, uh, uh, all their food references. So since last week, the EcoScores are being displayed on price tags in store and on our online web shops for about 15,000 products. And we're also approaching the 300 references for which an EcoScore is being added on pack. As mentioned in the video, the focus so far has mainly been on brand awareness. Uh, however, specifically in our BioPlanet stores, we've also started giving price promotions on products which EcoScore A and B for quite some time now. Uh, and since yesterday, for the entire Colorado group, which means Colorado, Spar, OK, BioPlanet and Collect and Go, we went one step further as well as we have now arrived in the activation phase. Um, we've launched a sustainable saving program in order to stimulate the purchase of products with EcoScore A and B. Buying products with EcoScore A is rewarded with two points, EcoScore B is rewarded with one point, and these points can then be used to support environmental projects. Environmental projects now mainly focusing still on um, nature restoration and conservation, uh, but besides this project, you can also use these uh, points uh, to attend one of our workshops at the Colorado Group Academy on a topic linked to sustainability. So this uh, Colorado Group Academy is a service which offers thematic workshops, very diverse workshops um, are being covered, including, for example, on vegetarian cooking, food waste reduction, or maybe very relevant for this presentation, on the interpretation of front of pack labels. Besides that, at Colorado, we also have the Smart with Food application, um, Smart with Food aims to optimize the customer shop, shopper journey by providing data-based nutrition support. It uh, provides, for instance, personalized nutrition advice and includes several lifestyle filters in order to facilitate healthy food consumption. And this brings me to my last slide. As you see, Colorado Group has taken several actions in order to facilitate those healthy, sustainable food choices. Are we going in the right direction? I think so. But are we there yet? Absolutely not. We know that there is still a long way to go. And with the right mindset, which I think at Colored we have this, uh, we are very eager to take this road and believe it is the only viable way forward. So step by step, we try to contribute our share to a more future proof food system. Um, and I'm happy to answer with this slide. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much, Michel. So I see that um, there are a few questions for Michel posted by Martina, with the first one being, um, are there any studies investigating the right, in quotation marks, amount of information that a consumer can get or understand by looking at a label? So the amount of information you mean? Yes. Right? I guess the saturation point is very low. Eh? So the situation we're in now with, with sometimes five, six labels is way too much. And I think based on the, the scientific evidence we have is that maybe one color graded uh, score can work because it works intuitively, as we've shown in one of our studies. Um, but as soon as you get to two or more, uh, all effects are likely to disappear because then this intuitive system uh, is much more difficult to be activated. Thank you. Um, another question from Martina is, did you investigate what are the messages that consumers get looking at the EcoScore label? Uh, I'm guessing this means how do they interpret the label? Uh, Martina, feel free to correct me or to add more if you, if I've misinterpreted your question. Yeah, because I, I did not really understand the question. Okay. Um, Does it well, on how, how consumers perceive the, the, the meaning of, of EcoScore or? I, I'm guessing it could be that if, yeah. What are the, the question is, um, did you investigate what are the messages that consumers get looking at an EcoScore label? 
Okay, yeah. Uh, yes, I think so. In the last study we did there in the, the lab experiments, after that, we also had a part uh, with an eye tracker behind the computer and there we asked them um, to indicate different uh, associations that popped up in their mind when seeing, in that case, it was the Enviro score, uh, the Spanish uh, variant of equal score, uh, to indicate what they think of when seeing that score. So yes, we studied that. And of course, depending on the name, it's not very surprising that some environment or ecological related topics will pop up in their mind. Okay, so I'm going to switch to some other um, questioners, even though uh, I'll come back to your questions, Martina, later, if, if there's time, but just to give other people a chance to have their questions answered. So, um, Jimena Gomez de Flor says, thank you, Michael, for the, for the interesting presentation. I see the EcoScore printed on the label itself. Is that for Colroyd's brand only? Yes, so far it's for color brands only. And okay, the um, a new question popped up. How does the cohort improve secondary data from Agrila Belize, and how is the uncertainty of results included in the final eco score? I think you will have to repeat that question. Sorry. How does cohort improve the secondary data from Agri Belize, the database, um, and? How does the uncertainty of results in how is the uncertainty of results included in the final eco score? Um, so we are not adapting so far. We are not adapting the original Agribalis database. So we are not making the LCA data as such more specific. We are using um, maybe I can go back to that slide just to make it clear. We are using these uh, factors, weighting factors, actually. So uh, we get the secondary data, so average LCA data, for example, an Apple, uh, an Eco score, uh, an, uh, an LCA score of an Apple. And then we, to make it more specific, we ask for data to our suppliers on their certificates, on transport, on the packaging, and on uh, policy on biodiversity to get this somewhat, somehow more specific. So although we are aware this is no, not the most scientifically robust method, but this helps to also uh, make the score a bit more product specific. So the right side here is primary data. OK. Um, I don't know if this answers um, some related questions people had about this point. So um, Leona asks if an eco score um, is using majority of secondary data, are we really telling consumers the environmental cost of a product? And therefore, are we incentivizing companies to innovate towards more sustainable products? Mm -hmm. uh, very good question. Uh, I think the first part, yes, because generally the trend to go to more plant based and less animal based is captured by the eco score database. The second part, uh, product reformulation and incentivizing producers is not at all uh, possible now with this system because it's not reflecting a specific producer's uh, score. So it is so far uh, only, I, I would say, viable to communicate to the consumer and not to improve production yet. So therefore, we would still have to wait for a system with more primary data. Thank you. And Martina asks, do you think that the eco score can distinguish among different ways of producing and processing of a certain food? For example, how can consumers distinguish the environmental impact of milk produced by a small local organic farmer and milk produced internationally? Mm. Um, that is, so I would say originally, I don't know how many milk uh, data points they have in the uh, Agribalis database by heart, but for those specific uh, categories mentioned, so the origin and the production methods, it will be possible to distinguish, right? But not for the, the uh, more in-depth LCA steps, uh, which are on the left side here. So uh, if it's organic, then you will normally get a better uh, equal score. The same for if it's uh, locally produced versus imported from a distant country. Thank you, Michal. And since I think we, I believe we've answered the questions related to you, I am. We have time for the question that was posed to Armando before. Um, so I hope 
It's okay for you to still answer a question related to your talk, Armando. Oh, someone asks, would scaring participants using the virtual reality simulation contribute to real life effective and sustainable interventions? Do you think? Can, can, you, can you repeat? Because I, I couldn't, re I, I cannot read that question. Okay, would scaring participants using the virtual reality simulation contribute to real life effective and sustainable interventions? Well, what we have seen is that, uh, um, so the, there is something that is changing. Um, since COVID, people are more and more um, using um, IT aided solutions almost for everything. So it is, uh, it is more likely that in the future this uh, kind of interactions would be more uh, more frequent. So I don't know if the world the 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 world is is caring. It's just presenting facts to people, and sometimes uh, consumers have the the uh, this idea that hey my actions don't really count. So it doesn't matter whether I uh, I eat healthily or not, or whether I am sustainable or not, my actions don't count. But if it's millions of people that say the same, then there's no change. So when they when they, we approximate people to this uh, to 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 the effectiveness that, that they can have, that that can change, and that's why there was uh, the 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 self efficacy was changing. Um, but even the what we expected that people would feel closer to the situation didn't that, that wasn't the case. But still, uh, after one one week at least, people were still eating slightly uh, less uh, carbon uh, emitting than than before. So it is it is a possibility. I think that there um, we cannot. Um, make it um, jollyful at uh, at different points. I mean, uh, can can we just make jokes? So we are we are we are doomed or we are destroying? Ha 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 ha! That's uh, that's something that um, yeah, probably is difficult. But probably there are there are ways to frame it in in such a way that are more inviting. So I would say we should invite people to join in a, in the transformation of the food system. We should invite people to be a part of a, um, of a new future, of, of creating the new future and uh, actually empower people on their choices and, uh, and their ability to, um, to create a, a better future. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that's a good response also because the questioner um, made a point that um, scaring people in nutrition science doesn't tend to work. So your suggestion of inviting people using more positive emotions is a, is a nice um, counter argument to that. Thank you very much. And now I'm very happy to present Emma Garnett, who just started a position in the health behaviors team at the University of Oxford. Um, just before this, she was a research, a research associate at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, um, where she estimated the environmental impact of supermarket food products, and she evaluated the promises and pitfalls of different policies to bring about more sustainable diets, such as carbon labelling. She is interested in understanding how to equitably overcome economic, political and social barriers to conserving biodiversity and reaching absolute zero greenhouse gas emissions. Today, she will be talking about what approaches work to increase vegetarian sales and reduce meat consumption. Thank you very much, Emma. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Betty. And hello, everyone. Uh, great to see so many people here. And thanks to the previous speakers for some um, really thought provoking presentations. So I will be talking about the work I did during my PhD, which was at the University of Cambridge and funded by the Natural Environment uh, Research Council. Now based at University of Oxford, please do get in touch on Twitter or my email address or LinkedIn if you would like to. So before we get onto the slightly depressing issues, I think it's worth remembering, you know, food is glorious, food is wonderful. It's a key part of every culture and our daily life. And that healthy and sustainable diets can be delicious and interesting and varied and full of flavor. 
and sort of thinking about the things that we are, are gaining and not just sort of you know foods that we're losing. So this is the good news. Like food is wonderful. Sustainable food is also wonderful. Unfortunately, some of the, the bad news and um, producing food um, has transformed the planet arguably more than any other human activity. Our food system is responsible for 6% of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, about 38% at least of Earth's and 70% of fresh water withdrawals. And as you've heard from some of the other speakers, but just to reiterate, why is reducing meat and dairy consumption important? So unfortunately, livestock farming is a leading cause of habitat loss, climate change and biodiversity loss. And there's two main reasons for this. And firstly, it's inefficient to feed soy um, to livestock and then to people. You're losing energy and mass as you go up the food chain. And secondly, ruminants such as cows, sheep and goats, they can eat grass, which we can't eat, but they release methane as part of their digestion, which is a very, very powerful greenhouse gas. And they also take up a large amount of land uh, to get a kilo of beef or, or mutton. And the more land we need to grow food, the less land there is for nature and sequestering a lot of carbon. So farmed animal products worldwide uh, uh, produce 18% of our calories and 37% of our protein, but they take up 83% of land use and 58% of food's greenhouse gas emissions. And those figures are from the Poor and Nemechek paper, which is well worth looking at that Armando mentioned as well. So let's have a look at the carbon footprint of some protein rich foods. And from the gray little circle to the blue little circle, 80% of different production systems are, you know, fall within those two extremes. So we're going from the 10th percentile to the 90th percentile. And what you can see is that, you know, yes, there is there is quite a big range of you know, different production systems. You're looking at, you know, beef from a beef herd. You know, that's a lot of variation. But as we're going down, looking from, you know, beef and prawns to pigs, poultry, fish, down to tofu and beans, generally speaking, even the worst performing, you know, tofu and nuts and peas, the ones that are worse from the environment are still, for the climate, are still much better than the best performing um, animal-based products. So yes, there is variation within products, but there's also really important variation between. So moving to a more plant-based diet is really essential. Some of you might have come across the planetary health diet, which was um, addressing the question, what does a global sustainable diet look like? And, you know, in a nutshell, it's a lot of beans and legumes and a lot of nuts. And uh, per week, only about one and a half sausages of red meat. So that's beef, um, pork, uh, sheep, uh, goat as well. About two small portions of chicken, two small portions of fish, and the equivalent of seven glasses of milk. So that might be in the form of milk or yogurt or cheese. And so with rounding this up to think about meat per person per year, which is how a lot of the stats are reported, that's a, uh, about 15 and a half kilos of meat, not fish, just meat per person per year. And let's round that up to about 20 kilos to account for food waste um, across the system. But how much meat are we actually eating? And this uh, world map shows meat supply per person per year. So this also is including some food waste. And if we're thinking about 20 kilos being the recommendation of the planetary health diet, you can see most countries, particularly you know, Europe, Australia, North America, Latin America, are really, really exceeding that. And it's you know South Asia, East Asia and Africa, which is sort of staying uh, within those boundaries. So meat consumption is an environmental issue. It's also a big global inequality issue as well. And from 1961 to 2017, meat per person has almost doubled from about 23 kilos to 43 kilos. And you know, the human population has, has more than doubled from 3 billion to about 8 billion. So we're producing an awful lot of livestock uh, you know, on a crowded planet, and it's just not uh, sustainable. So thinking about how we could change diets, we've had some really interesting stuff on labelling uh, in a piece in the British Medical Journal from last year as a co-author on. We thought in terms of population level interventions, so not ones that you know people have to pay attention to and kind of learn and um, 
and think about kind of labels and impacts. But we thought of like two main pillars of different interventions. So changing the physical environment and the economic environment. So we can think about altering um, you know, stores, cafeterias and restaurants and also villages and towns. So do people have access to you know, healthy and sustainable diets or would you have to get in a car and drive somewhere to get a vegetable as an extreme example? So essentially that boils down to decreasing the opportunities to consume unsustainable foods and increasing the opportunities to consume more sustainable foods. Thinking about the economic environment, how do we change the prices of foods through subsidies, taxes or other material incentives such that sustainable food options are the most affordable and the less sustainable food options are the least affordable. And my research study setting for my PhD was the University of Cambridge uh, cafeterias and the different colleges. So there's a map of the UK and that's roughly where Cambridge is and looked at three different interventions. So changing the order of meals, physical intervention, the availability, also a physical intervention and a small change in price, an economic intervention. I'll explain these in a lot more detail. And what's really, really exciting about this setting that uh, it's quite hard to do experiments in real world conditions. It's rel relatively easy to run studies online and ask people, you know, what would you eat? What would you choose? But to actually do a field study in an actual canteen and see we've made this change and what are people actually choosing to buy and then eat um, is, is really, uh, really valuable data and not anything that's so easy to do. And so huge thanks not only to my PhD supervisors but to all of the kitchen staff and catering managers that worked with me to run these studies and get these findings. And so the outcome we were looking at, we divided meals, you know, vegetarian and meat meals. So we wanted to see what is the percentage of vegetarian main meals sold. So these are meals without meat or fish but they might have some cheese uh, or eggs in but they could also be vegan. And we got sales data from over 200,000 individual meal selections. So, you know, a real, real wealth of data over many, many months. So thinking about physical environments, we um, first of all looked at order. And there's this hypothesis that you get higher vegetarian sales when the vegetarian option is placed first in line, i.e. nearest the entrance. And there's this real assumption, you know, place healthy things first. People are more likely to buy them widely assumed to be effective, but it's quite largely untested. It does come up in the nudge book. I'm just going to skip over reading that quote for the sake of. So here is how we ran an experimental setup and we were alternating between meat first, which is that graphic on the left where meat is nearest the entrance and veg first, where you've got um, the vegetarian option nearest the entrance. And we altered that week by week across the nine week university terms in the cafeterias. But because there were two different colleges in which we were running this experiment, there was another really important form of variation. So in the two graphs on the left and in the middle, there was a short distance between the meat and vegetarian option. They were very, very near each other, about 85 centimetres. However, in one um, canteen setup, there was a very long distance, 180 centimetres between the meat option and the vegetarian option. So we've got these short distance and long distance conditions. And most canteens you'll come across have got a short distance set up. And here are some of the results we found. So up the Y axis, so going from the bottom to the top, that's in vegetarian sales as a percentage of total meal sales. We're going from about 0 to 40 percent there. And what we found was under the long distance conditions uh, that, yes, putting the vegetarian option nearest the entrance when the meat option is far away did increase vegetarian sales. Good news. This was about a five percentage point increase from about 18 to about 23 percent. So this was quite exciting. This is what we were expecting to find. However, under that short distance condition, which is a very common setup in canteens, there were quite complicated results and that putting the vegetarian option first didn't increase its sales. And in fact, in some circumstances, it could even backfire and putting it first sometimes actually decreased vegetarian sales. So this is really, really important that things we think will work don't always work. And it's so important to test hypotheses and in our intuitions with data. Uh, when this came out, there was some news coverage of it, and uh, which really did a great summary of the findings that can putting vegetarian options first increase their sales. Yes, if the meat options over a meter and a half away, but when they're next to each other, maybe not. 
very important to test our intuitions with. Something we could do looking at the next two interventions, thanks to the colleges, is that we're able to track um, anonymised individuals because students, the diners, uh, pay for meals with their university cards. And so we can um, track their purchases and 90% of meal purchases can be linked to individuals. And looking at previous data, we can then get a picture of how individuals behave and divide diners into quartiles based on how often they choose vegetarian meals. And this makes our analyses much, much more statistically powerful. And so divided into quarters, we've got you know, the most veg quarter of diners, the people who are most likely to pick a vegetarian option, down to more veg, less veg, least veg. And you can have a think about which quarter you might be in in a university setting. So the second intervention we were looking at was availability. And we hypothesized that as more of the menu was a vegetarian option, we would see more vegetarian sales. And we ran a natural experiment in two college cafeterias, which naturally varied the number of vegetarian and total options served. So to give you an example of this, have a look at Monday lunchtime. We've got three options, two of which are vegetarian. So two out of three is 67% of vegetarian availability. Let's hop over to Wednesday lunchtime. We've got four options, two of which are vegetarian or vegan. So two in four, so that's 50% vegetarian availability. So we've got a percentage a vegetarian availability and then also a percentage of vegetarian sales and how are those related and here are the results and this was i think the you know the straightest and most exciting <laughs> line of my phd and we found doubling vegetarian availability from 25 percent so this is the x-axis along the bottom to 50 percent led to an increase um 15 percentage point increase in vegetarian sales and overall sales remained roughly constant so one of the quickest ways of shifting people, um, customers, citizens, your work colleagues away from meat and towards more sustainable diets, you know, replace a meat option with a vegetarian option, cook it and it will get eaten. And what was really exciting and a bit surprising was that increasing vegetarian availability led to all demographics buying more vegetarian meals, which we weren't particularly expecting. Um, and so when we've divided these diners from the least to most vegetarian quartiles, actually we found not only did the most vegetarian quartile increase their likelihood of picking an option, you know, we might have thought they were very committed and wouldn't change no matter if there were just one vegetarian options or many, they responded. But the least vegetarian quartile down at the bottom in dark red actually had the strongest response going, you know, it, it, he, a relatively like, a really big increase. They weren't stubbornly sticking with meat when more and more vegetarian options became available. So that was really exciting that, you know, this, we saw this work across, you know, across different diners when we'd group them like that, which was a slightly um, uh, hopeful and slightly counterintuitive finding. All right, moving on to quite a small experiment on economic environments. So we know that price is a really important influence on citizen food purchases. There have been many calls for meat taxes, but there are none currently in operation. And also subsidies dominate UK farming profits and a lot of the EU as well. You can see particularly up at the top, you know, grass fed livestock, which has a big impact on biodiversity you know, and the climate. Uh, is really reliant um, on subsidies in particular and down at the bottom horticulture and, horticulture and poultry at least so but all farm types are receiving a lot of subsidies so this is not a free market environment and so our price experiment design this was just in one college cafeteria um, in autumn term and halfway through the term we increased the meat option price by 20p from uh, £2.52 to £2.72 and we decreased the vegetarian option price by 20p from £2.05 to £1.85. And so we were just looking at meat and vegetarian and there were, in this experiment, fish and vegan options and those meal prices were unchanged. And what did we find? So across um, you know, 106 meal times and you know, over 5,000 meals and 325 diners, there was a small increase in overall vegetarian sales, about 3.2 percentage points, but actually no significant change to overall meat sales. And in fact, fish and vegan sales decreased a bit. So it was quite a mixed picture. 
And what was particularly interesting when we looked at the individual sales and what was happening there, that that increase, this was driven by the most vegetarian quartile of diners. And their vegetarian sales increased by 13.7 percentage points. So that's massive. So you can see here in this graph on the right, that dark blue bar going from that baseline price condition to that change in the meat and vegetarian options, sales have really shifted. That blue bar's gone from lower to much higher. You look at the other three, the pale blue, yellow, and red, more veg, less veg, least veg, they didn't see any significant change between the control baseline and the intervention. So we were hypothesizing that, okay, this small price change, it was enough to shift the, you know, the most vegetarian diners, but perhaps we need to see bigger price changes, 20p's not so much, uh, to persuade these other diners to also shift their behavior. So that contrasts with our availability findings. And there's a lot of really exciting work that's happened at Cambridge University with the sustainable food policy that I helped advise on. And this was introduced in 2016 uh, by Nick and Paula White, who you can see there in the photo, who are absolute trailblazers. And there are 14 cafeterias across the university, but this doesn't include the university colleges that I've been working with. Cambridge has a, a, an odd setup, but these are more departmental cafeterias. And they had four main pillars of their sustainable food policy. Uh, number one, to improve the vegetarian and vegan choices and to actively promote them. They removed beef and lamb from the menu entirely, the foods with the highest um, greenhouse gas and land footprints. They only served uh, sustainably sourced fish and there was a real focus on cutting food waste. And this food policy had a massive, massive impact. So um, uh, Anya Doherty from Food Steps uh, ran some analyses and compared March to May 2015 with March to May 2018 procurement. So this is, instead of looking at the till sales, this is the ingredients they were buying in. And the carbon and land footprint per kilo of food decreased by about a third. So it's a huge, huge shift. And there was a 2% um, increase in gross profits as well. And we were very excited to briefly make the front page of BBC News. And I really recommend checking out the interview uh, with Nick White. If you Google Earth Optimism, Reducing an Organisation's Footprint, you can hear a lot of insights um, from Nick, who has you know, 101 different things to think about and still manages to prioritise sustainability front and centre. And then a more general point, you know, organisations are really vital for climate and nature action. There's often a debate, you know, are we looking at system change or individual change? And the answer is we need both. Um, but organisations, like quite broadly defined as you know, businesses, universities, you know, hospitals, schools, local government, anything intermediate in size and influence, this is a really key role in catalyzing change. So if you are someone who makes decisions for others outside your household, you are a policymaker. Do you get to decide what food gets ordered in? Do you get to have an influence in your organization's transport policy? Do your neighbors you know, listen to you? Can you help make changes in your neighborhoods? And therefore caterers are such key sustainable food policymakers. And so yes to system change and individual change and really thinking about going upstream and um, so we're not asking every citizen one by one to change their diets. We've got caterers who are you know, changing the parameters of what people can choose to make sustainable decisions easier for everyone, which is really, really key. And so a um, quick summary, uh, caterers are really important policymakers for sustainable food. Uh, placing the vegetarian option nearest the entrance. Um, in some contexts, this can increase vegetarian sales by five percentage points, but it's unreliable and can backfire, so do be careful. And then doubling the availability of vegetarian options. This is really effective. You know, replace meat options with veggie ones, a 15 percentage point increase in vegetarian sales. And that was effective across all groups of diners. A small change in price, um, increased vegetarian sales for diners most likely to choose a vegetarian option. And again, a huge thanks to my PhD supervisors and all of the kitchen staff, catering managers and chefs that made all of these experiments possible. And thank you to you for joining us today. And I'll be very glad to take some questions and do get in touch if you would like to. Thank you so much, Emma, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, we have some questions. Um, the first one being at the level of the dishes on offer at the cafeteria, did you look into how the vegetables are prepared and presented 
and the types of vegetables because um, the, it could be that these factors might influence choices as well? That is a really, really good question. And I think you're entirely right. And the, the challenge with these experiments in the field is that if we saw um, higher vegetarian sales for one option for one day, we can't know if it's the vegetarian option that's popular or the meat option it's presented with is unpopular. Because these are presented together, that you'll have you know, steak compared to a veggie lasagna and a chicken casserole compared to you know, a mushroom risotto. So we weren't able to control for that. Uh, but it's a really important question and uh, different research is happening on that. Okay, thanks. Um, did you see any difference between vegetarian or vegan choices between these two types that were purchased? Um, we were not able in most colleges to differentiate those on the till, um, so not really. Um, but in terms of a couple of colleges, and this chapter is in my PhD, though it's not published yet, but you can find it online, um, the different meat types, so we looked at beef and lamb, pork, chicken, fish, and there were really strong differences in gender. So men and women were equally likely to go for fish, but chicken, pork, beef and lamb, men were much more likely to pick and vegetarian sales much higher from female students. And so in fact, um, the if I go back to it, which I might be able to, let's see, um, the one I showed of the availability from these two different colleges, hopefully you can see this, you can see there's a difference. College one has got higher vegetarian sales than college two. And I wondered why that would be. Is this that, you know, they're preparing things differently, the, the options to taste during college one. When I looked at gender sort of assigned by um, first names that, uh, yeah, college one has more female students than college two. And that entirely explained that difference. So that's driven by gender, not by anything else. And I was quite surprised um, how strong that was, that effect. So um, that's good to know. Uh, and the next question asks, what are the interventions you made, like um, uh, positioning the different uh, meats, vegetables, um, making, increasing the availability of vegetarian uh, dishes and increasing the and changing the price. I guess these changes were not advertised, so students were not aware of these changes. Uh, good question. Um, so the position and the availability were, were not advertised because that's the sort of thing that might get changed um, you know, anyway by the kitchen staff. Uh, the price change was advertised and said, um, and we're making a small change in the prices to better match the cost of ingredients. And that's partly why we changed it by 20p, because um, increasing the meat price by 20p and decreasing the vegetarian price by 20p actually meant that those prices match the ingredients cost. So previously, the vegetarians had almost been like subsidising the meat eaters. So um, that was, uh, you know, changed on the boards and there was this um, electronic screen outside the canteen that rotated round. And on one of the slides, um, yeah, the diners were informed about that. Oh, that's very interesting to know. Um, the next question asks, what, to what extent do you think your findings, because they're looking at student populations, whether they can be generalised to other populations? Really, really important question. And yeah, so this is, you know, one country, the UK, one university, Cambridge, which is and students. So in many ways, not representative of the country or indeed the world at large. Uh, there have been other, um, at least one of the study looking at availability in workplace canteens. And they've also found um, in increasing availability did um, increase sales. But it's really, really important. I think what's quite useful is because it's such a, you know, small setting in many ways that we can compare the effects between availability and order and price within that university context. Um, but yes, the um, generalizable, yes, but how much? Um, unclear, a really important question. Okay, um, the next question, I'm going to do a little bit of interpretation, so uh, correct me questioner if I'm incorrect, but they say, did the students react on the change in price availability of meat dishes? And I'm guessing this means beyond 
the results that you showed here because these results they will be available to everybody via the recording so if you missed anything in what was measured you can look this up but i'm guessing this question is about beyond what you have presented here yes uh so the caterers didn't receive any complaints um about the changes uh which was really positive um you know no complaints about the small price change or the availability or the order um, which is interesting because a really popular sustainability intervention in a lot of canteens is introducing meat free Mondays. And there's usually a lot of advertising, you know, a lot of fanfare. And people can, some people can react really negatively to that and say, no, you're taking away our choices. You know, we're not a fan of this. We don't feel we've been consulted. And similarly, um, I think it's good to talk to people about what you're doing. But also, if you really advertise that you've removed something, People are unlikely to respond positively to that. So uh, Nick and Paula White, they, they decided to take beef and lamb off the menu. They ran the you know uh, the cafeterias. That was their decision. Um, and they didn't receive a single complaint about that, not one. And then when they announced and said, hey, we've got all these really, really great results and we've cut our carbon and land footprint, people said, oh, but we would have complained. They said, well, no, you wouldn't have done because you didn't. <laughs> the, the, it, so I think like how we go about introducing these things, we need to think about it really carefully to not um, antagonise people, but to do it in a considerate way and kind of bring everyone on board. But um, yes, so it was encouraging that we didn't find you know any complaints or pushback in the experiments we ran, and that also means they're more feasible for other places to run because. OK, maybe it would have been interesting to have changed the prices by by a lot. But if that's not feasible for this canteen to do, it's not feasible for many other canteens. OK, um, yeah, that's a that's a good point you make about feasibility. So we have a um, question about whether there was any changes to the naming of the dishes. And, yeah. Uh, no changes to the names, uh, but if you look up the World Resources Institute and their um, Cool Food uh, program, they've done a lot of work about the naming of dishes. And, you know, don't call something a vegan lasagna, call it an aubergine and chickpea lasagna. Uh, so that that's an important point of you know, how we're marketing food. OK, and final question. Uh, so someone asks, you mentioned in your talk that um, they took beef and lamb off the menu and there's a question on whether there's any further recipe reformulation um, as a result of the, the uh, results of your studies. For example, maybe to increase the vegetarian to um, reduce meat proportions or increase vegetarian proportions. Yeah, so uh, quite a few of the colleges I've worked with have said, yeah, we're, we're putting more um, vegan vegan and vegetarian options on the menu and taking meat ones off. So that was really, really encouraging. I think once they'd sort of tried it as part of the research, so that's gone forward. I think that's becoming more normal. Um, I think it should just be, you know, baseline rather than special. But, you know, if you go to a restaurant and they've only got one vegetarian option on the menu, tell them to put more on and take more meat off and do sort of speak up. And also places that do have a lot of veggie options, tell them that you like that and you're going to go back um, and eat more. And it's not, if they say, oh, we don't have many vegetarian options on the menu because not many people eat them. Say, no, that, that's back to front. <laughs> if you put more on and they you know, taste okay, people will eat them. So chicken and egg, so to speak. Okay. Um, thank, I want to give a big thank you to our speakers for all your your amazing talks, also your very um, uh, practical advice resulting from your talks. The final question was the website Emma just mentioned regarding the naming of food. Did you say it was like the World Resource Institute? Yes, uh, I'll see if I can go find that and put it in the chat. OK, so thank you all so much. I realized that I didn't manage to answer your questions during this symposium, but I will answer them in writing and send them to you. So a big. Sorry, Armando, you're muted. I need to leave. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you so much, Armando, and thank you very much, everybody. We will send you the resources that were presented today.